As Jenny mentioned, I'm going to kind of give an update on some of the newer things that we've been working on on, on weed management at the university. Um, talk a little bit about Palmer. You know, this, this talk 20 years ago was probably a list of 10, 15 new products that came on the market. Uh, a lot of them might have been new active ingredients and so on. But if, if my talk today was going to be strictly on new products for corn and soybeans, um, I'd be done by now. So there's not a lot of new products out there. And uh, we're going to talk about that. So first of all, there is a lot of change that goes on uh, with, with weed management and weed control from year to year. Um, and trying to keep up with that is extremely difficult. You know, I do this, you know, weed science is my specialty and I'm involved with it every day. And it's hard to keep up with it. And so one of the things that we've developed to, to help keep this stuff straight, provide a resource for, for everyone in the room, is this uh, Mid-Atlantic Weed Management Guide. Uh, a number of years ago, back, you know, uh, Jim Parichetti and then Ron Ritter and all of us have been doing the, uh, 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 developing these uh, uh, weed management guides for the states. And about three years ago, we decided to do a regional one. Why should De Pennsylvania and Delaware have different, different guides when the information is the same? They all had the same information. We got together every year to compare notes and, and revise it. Um, but so we decided to put one publication together. So Jenny's got a, a copy there in the back of, of it to take a look at it. There is a cost, yes. So it, it, it covers, oops, it covers uh, corn, soy, sorghum, soybeans, small grains, pastures. Um, we have a section in the back on prob problem weeds. Um, so it's, uh, it's quite comprehensive. Some of the, 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 the key things that, that get used a lot, we have a premix table in there. So um, you're getting ready to, to think about uh, what you're going to be spraying on your corn this year. Are you going to use Acuron or Resicor or Sure Start or just stick with the old bicep? What's in all those products and how much of, of, of the individual active ingredients are in those products? It's extremely difficult to keep straight. That's what these premix tables do. They list all the, 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 the uh, uh, commercial formulations uh, from, um, that are used in the area and what are the components of that. Uh, we have relative effectiveness tables. So how does one product compare to the other on a number of different weed species? We've expanded this in the last couple of years to include burn down and now with uh, burn down of cover crops. And we have uh, tables on, on rates and timing for the different products. So there's a lot of good publications out there, particularly from the manufacturers, but they tend to target their products or a select few. This has got all the major manufacturer products that are used in the region. So it's, it's, it's quite comprehensive. But um, as, as Jenny mentioned, it, it, uh, there is a fee. Um, we are selling it through Penn State because they are one of the few schools that still have a publications office. There's, here's the website. Um, I have uh, some slips up here with cards that uh, you can uh, um, grab a slip. It's got the uh, URL for the address. It's $25 for a hard copy, uh, $15 for a PDF. If you want just just a, a free version of it. There's one available at our website, UD Weed Guides. It's a low quality, uh, poor resolution, but it's a, it's a free version. If you don't have this guide, you, you really need to get it. So one of the things that's, that's really kind of driving our, our weed control programs in the last few years have been herbicide resistant weeds. We can't really talk about weed management these days without talking about resistance. And, uh, you know, it's not a new problem. The first report of resistance was back in the 50s. Um, but it really wasn't until we got into the 80s where this really kind of ratcheted up. You know, as early as 1970s, uh, I think Maryland was one of the first states to report trizine resistant lambs quarter and pigweed. Um, and uh, in the 80s, the uh, uh, sulfonylureas and ALS herbicides came along. Um, helped to control some of those pigweeds and lambs quarters that were triazine resistance. That worked really well for about 10 years. And then we started to get a lot of resistance uh, to that chemistry. 
Then the Roundup Ready technology came out and uh, it worked really well. It kind of helped save, the, uh, improve our weed control with all these uh, ALS and triazine resistant weeds. But that lasted for about 10 years and now we're starting to see more and more glyphosate resistance. And so we're, we, we're, we're, we're losing um, the availability of some of these products because of a resistance. This is not a unique problem to the Mid-Atlantic. Uh, mid Every state in the U.S. has problems with it. Um, there's at least 75 different species that are resistant to at least one active ingredient. And grain crops are not unique either. It, uh, it affects vegetables, fruit, rangeland, aquatics, across the board. So it really is, is something that, that we're all needing to deal with. The big problem though is we're not finding, we're not uh, able to kind of spray our way out of the situation with use of new chemistry. While there may be new active ingredients that come on the market, there aren't any new mechanisms of action or new sites of action. How does that herbicide kill the weed? That is not anything new. We're finding that, uh, that we're, the, the, the most recent herbicide uh, mechanism of action that we're using was developed in the 1980s. So while companies are looking very actively for it, it's expensive, there's a really high standard of which they're trying to uh, achieve, and uh, so far just haven't found a new active ingredient that's going to help us out. So as a result, we've got to maintain the products that we have. And a lot of that's gonna come down to using integrated strategies to put less pressure on our herbicides and reduce the selection for new resistance. You know, whether it's, it's uh, uh, mechanical weed control and uh, cultural weed control, biological, um, and chemical is still gonna be part of that. But uh, integrating these as much as possible to reduce the selection pressure on chemicals. And you notice the whole basis of this integrated weed management strategy is prevention. If we can stop bringing in a, a uh, invasive or, or, or a resistant biotype or a problem weed that's difficult to control, if we can prevent it from moving from field to field um, or even within the, our own field, uh, it's going to make things a lot easier for us. You know, a lot of times we hear about resistance um, and, and we, 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 we go right to talking about different modes of action um, and, and tank mixing and so on. And while that helps, um, again, we just have a limited source of chemistry that's, that we're looking to prolong as, 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 as long as we possibly can. And so we really need to start to look at some of these non-chemical approaches and where are they helping us out and how can we maximize their effectiveness. And one of the ways that uh, we, we tool that we've got is uh, cover crops. Um, how many folks are growing cover crops here? <laughs> I know there's a lot more than that. But uh, yeah, everyone's growing cover crops. Uh, and cover crops do a whole multiple uh, uh, of things. This is just a really short list of things that, that, that cover crops can do for us. Um, and one that, that always shows up is weed suppression. But how can we use that uh, cover crop to really help, help us uh, with weed suppression and weed control and take less of the pressure off these chemicals? Um, you know, planting a, a fall cover crop like rye or, or uh, um, barley or, or a legume um, helps not only with controlling our winter annual weeds like chickweed and henbit, but if we grow enough of that biomass and keep a, a residue on the soil surface, it can serve as a barrier for summer annual weeds like pigweeds and lamb's quarters as well. It's just kind of illustrating that this is from Penn State, uh, hairy vetch, where they left a strip out with no hairy vetch. You can see just loaded with mustards in this strip. Granted, there are still mustards over here, but notice the number is a lot less, they're a lot fewer, and they're a lot smaller, meaning they're more susceptible to our herbicides. So how can we help to manage cover crops to improve weed suppression? You know, looking at optimum planting date, uh, when are we gonna kill it? And this is one that, that I think a lot of people overlook is this whole termination timing. Um, using the right cover crops for the right situation. Uh, a cover crop that, that 
uh, shades ground early in the fall is gonna be much more competitive with winter annuals than something that's a little bit slower growing. Rye, for instance, if you plant rye, plant rye next to say uh, uh, wheat or barley, you go back about three weeks after planting, you can still see the rows of the, of the rye and, the, and uh, excuse me, the, the wheat and the barley. Rye, on the other hand, because of its early growth, it stools out, covers the ground a lot quicker. It's a better competitor with winter annual weeds than some of these other. It's not a huge difference, it's a little bit of difference, but that all adds up over time. So planting winter cover crops early can increase their wheat competitiveness. Um, and for some species like the legumes and the forage or tillage radish, they have a fairly narrow window of when we can get them in and, and be effective. Cereal rye, on the other hand, has a fairly wide window compared to some of these others, uh, but it has limits. I mean, we can't plant it in, in mid-November and expect to produce a, quite a bit of biomass. Um, you know, here's, here's an example of this is again from up at Penn State. Uh, this picture was taken, taken in mid-April and uh, this, the front part was planted on September 15th with rye. The back part was planted on October 15th. And notice the amount of biomass that's there. Um, earlier planting dates does help get that off to a quicker start and increase overall biomass. But what often doesn't uh, get talked about is how you might be able to compensate for those later planting dates by delaying that termination date. So this is, again, uh, some work that was done up at Penn State with uh, uh, Stephen Mursky. They looked at different planting dates and different termination dates. So they started planting by in, in uh, August 25th, planted about every 10 days all the way out to October 15th. And then they came back and sprayed in May, from May 1 up as, as, um, to May 30th. So let's look at this individually. So this is their um, early termination date, so this was killed on the 1st of May. You can see though from planting at August 25th out through October 15th, there was a, a, a distinctive trend towards less biomass with that later planting date. Compare that, um, and this is the uh, termination on May 30th. Again, a very strong strand, a trend to uh, earlier the planting date, the more the biomass. But by just delaying that termination by 20 days, look at how much more overall um, biomass is produced. Again, that trend towards uh, later planting dates, lower um, biomass, but delaying that termination in the spring increases the overall biomass. So with, with a uh, um, termination timing of May 30th, um, but planting from September 15th to October 15th uh, saw an increase of, or a decrease of about 20,000, excuse me, 2,000 pounds of rye by delaying it uh, uh, 30 days. Delaying it 30, uh, delaying our termination timing by 30 days in the fall, we had an increase of about 6,000 pounds. And notice here, um, with this October 15th planting date, delaying our termination from May 20th to just 10 days to May 30th, it was about a 3,000 pound increase in biomass. So that spring, we're getting an awful lot of biomass production in a short period of time. One of the ways to compensate for some of our later planting dates is by uh, um, later termination dates. Granted, it comes with a, a, another host of, of issues and challenges. You know, slugs are always a concern with these higher biomass. Having the right equipment to uh, get good seed soil contact, uh, possibly uh, spreading uh, fertilizer with some tall cover crops can be a challenge as well. But at the same time, this is one of our tactics that we have and it's fairly effective for suppressing weeds. This is looking at uh, cereal rye on uh, winter annual weeds. This is uh, where we had uh, no rye, so this is just basic no-till, uh, where we um, went out and, and, and sprayed our burned down herbicide either six weeks, four weeks, or two weeks before planting. Our planting date was June 1. So on April 13th, this is the number of winter annual weeds that were in the plots before we sprayed it with, with, with Roundup. 
Um, we had a, just under uh, 20 plants per meter squared. Delaying our termination by just a matter of, of two weeks, the number of winter annual weeds had jumped. We had quite a bit of emergence just in that two week period. Um, more weeds out there that, that we were spraying. On the other hand, where we had rye, two bushels of rye planted in the fall at uh, um, six weeks before planting, uh, we were right about five plants per meter squared. Notice here, as if we let that uh, uh, at, at uh, two weeks before um, planting, we're down to, a, we, we had about four plants per meter square. Many fewer winter annual weeds where we had the rye compared to the no rye. Fewer weeds we've got, the fewer plants that we're spraying, the less selection pressure we're putting on. The other thing that this doesn't show is that these, uh, the, these individual plants were a lot smaller and more susceptible to the herbicide application. The same trial, we carried it out looking at the effect on summer annual weeds, in this case, ragweeds, morning glories, pigweeds, uh, um, and so on. Um, so where we had no rye um, in the plots over the course of the summer, we had an, uh, a cumulative emergence or total of emergence of about 300 plants per meter squared. Went out and sprayed six weeks early pre-plant. Um, we didn't really have a, much of an impact on the amount of summer annual weeds in those plots. Um, because we went out, that, that, that rye was smaller. Uh, it uh, was, was a lot more leaf tissue, a lot more susceptible to degradation once it got in contact with the soil. So it really didn't provide much in the way of, of weed suppression. But delaying it, again, just a matter of two weeks, um, look at the, the amount of, uh, uh, or the reduction in the number of summer annual weeds throughout the, uh, the summer in those plots. We're going from just under 300 plants per meter square to under 100 meters, 100 plants per meter square. So a big reduction in the number by just delaying that termination by a matter of, of two weeks. Not only does it slow up um, the emergence, it also uh, affects the growth of weeds. This is a study from University of Tennessee where they uh, are looking at Palmer amaranth and the number of days for Palmer amaranth to emerge and reach four inches in height. In uh, this particular trial in Tennessee, it took a matter of about 15 days for uh, Palmer amaranth to reach four inch height in bare ground no-till. However, where they had rye or, or wheat, um, it took 27, 28 days to reach that four inch height. So it slowed down the growth of the winter annuals, uh, excuse me, Palmer amaranth made it more susceptible, easier to control. All this adds up to helping our, the, the, the activity and the, the uh, effectiveness of our herbicide sprays. Notice in none of these cases are we talking about eliminating herbicides, we're just trying to maximize the effectiveness we have and reduce the selection pressure on the weeds that are in the field. So, I'm gonna, any, any questions about cover crops or any comments about cover crops on, on weed control before I kind of move into a few other topics? All right, talk a little bit about small grains now. Um, both, uh, uh, you know, I, I got a lot of questions in the last week or so about spraying small grains. Nice weather, we've had uh, good growing conditions, um, but it's a little wet to get in the field, whether they should get out and spray, uh, what should they spray, is the timing right? You know, there's, there's a lot of things that go on in, in, in making these uh, early spring applications effective. And in many cases, we can kind of get around that worry and concern if we went out in the fall and had made these same herbicide applications in the fall. Making them in the fall while the weeds are small, susceptible, they haven't gone through that winter stress and uh, um, eliminate that early season weed pressure with our fall applications. Uh, and when I talk about fall, Talking really down in Georgetown at the Research and Education Center, we typically will be putting our treatments out up through the first week of December. So we're not talking about a narrow window in the fall, but a fall treatment while the weeds are still actively growing. Yes, that time of year we get a lot of, of killing frost at night, it gets cold, but that soil is still warm and that soil is, is, is a heat sink. 
and it keeps those winter annuals growing and actively growing um, well throughout uh, uh, November. It gives us an opportunity to go out and spray uh, and control that first flush of weeds instead of trying to control them over the winter. You know, just think of the, the, the weather we've had the last couple of winters, of uh, the amount of growth in, in January and early February, um, and now trying to cr control them into mid-March when weather gets dicey, wind is, 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 is blowing. It's, it's more difficult to, to do. So I would encourage you, if you're growing uh, small grains, to think about uh, fall applications. One of the weeds that we're, we're getting more and more questions about is uh, common chickweed. Uh, common chickweed that's now resistant to ALS inhibiting herbicides. The ALS herbicides have been the most common ones we've used in small grains for a long time. Um, it's also a, a class of chemistry that folks have been using uh, you know, it's just to help keep the fields clean um, throughout the winter. And that's put a lot of selection pressure uh, for resistance of this ALS, uh, of this chickweed. So we now have a lot of biotypes out there that are resistant, uh, a lot of fields with resistant uh, um, ALS, or resistant common chickweed. Some of the products that, that has worked well on these are uh, Quellex, which is a new product from Dow AgroSciences, um, Metribuzin, uh, we talk about uh, Metribuzin, which is a 24C that we have in Delaware, and uh, there's, it's, it's pending for use in uh, Maryland for, for uh, chickweed. And then also Star Rain or Fluoroxapir um, is, is, is also something that folks have been using on this ALS resistant chickweed. I would say that the Quellex and the Metribuzin are the better of the, of, of the three options there, while Star Rain gives you a little bit more flexibility. Um, but, uh, uh, and it still does a fairly good job. It's just not, just not quite as good as the Quellex and the Metribuzin. So the, the, the Quellex new product, uh, relatively new from uh, Dow, it uh, is a combination of two active ingredients, a group two herbicide and a group four. This haloxifen is a plant growth regulator. The fluoroxulam uh, is a, uh, um, is a uh, uh, group two herbicide be used on wheat and barley. Um, it's got a, a three month rotation to soybeans, nine month rotation to, to peas, 15 to, to most other vegetables. Um, another product uh, in small grains been asked a little bit about is, is Husky. Um, it's uh, from Bear Crop Science. It's basically Bucktrill and an HPPD inhibiting herbicide. Has a fairly wide window. Um, but it is a, a four-month rotation to soybean, so it's got to be an early spring application. This works quite well on our ALS-resistant uh, um, mare's tail or horseweed in small grains. But as I mentioned, with the ALS-resistant chickweed, the star rain fluoroxapir is one of the products that uh, a lot of folks are using and been very satisfied with. It's a, as I mentioned, it's a group four. It's not as volatile as the 2,4-D or the dicamba in that group. Um, use rate is uh, 4.8 to 6.5 uh, fluid ounces. It doesn't need an adjuvant. Um, it seems to, you know, it's, it's flexible in terms of being tank mixed with other herbicides. And it seems to enhance the activity of some of our ALS herbicides like Harmony Extra on some species. Uh, but for, uh, um, some states, it's a 120-day uh, rotation. We have a 90-day rotation in, in uh, Delaware. I think Maryland is, is working on theirs. It hasn't come through yet. But this active ingredient of fluoroxapir is starting to show up in a lot of premixes. While the rate range is 4.8 to 6.5, about five and a half ounces is what we recommend, pretty much as a minimum use rate. Dow, um, excuse me, DuPont, well, actually it's FMC now, um, has this product Centralis, um, which is Harmony Extra plus Star Rain. Um, it is a, a use rate of, of 12 fluid ounces, will get you uh, Harmony as well as uh, uh, 5.6 ounces of Star Rain. Notice the Centralis is Harmony, it's not Harmony Extra, it's just Harmony. So it's just the thyphin sulfuron component of it. It doesn't have the express 
portion of the Harmony Extra. So this is a, a product that uh, uh, will give you both the uh, uh, ALS herbicide as well as this, this fluoroxapir for resistant chickweed control. Uh, another way of getting this fluoroxapir for ALS resistant chickweed control is Axial Star. However, one of the things to note, uh, it has a single use rate of 16.4 fluid ounces, which gives you Axial, but the Star Rain is only 4.3 ounces. That's a low rate of Star Rain. Um, again, remember, I'd like to see about 5.5 uh, ounces or more of Star Rain. So this would need to be spiked in order to get that up to the actual use rate. Again, this type of stuff is hard to keep straight. Our weed management guides got this information in there, and it's a very useful tool. Any questions about small grains? All right. Anybody recognize this weed? Yeah, Palmer amaranth. And how do we know it's Palmer amaranth? Because that's all we talk about these days, right? But uh, it is a, uh, um, with the, big, the, big way of, uh, the, the best way of telling Palmer amaranth on small seedlings is lack of hairs. It doesn't have any hairs on the stem or on the leaves or on the petioles. Our uh, common pigweed or redroot pigweed or smooth pigweed all have hairs on that uh, stem. And on those seedlings, um, that is the best way of identifying and separating Palmer amaranth from smooth pigweed. There are other ways of separating it as the plant gets bigger, but usually by, some, by the time some of these other characteristics show up, it's too late to spray Palmer amaranth. Palmer amaranth is from the uh, southwest part of the United States in northern uh, Mexico in the uh, uh, desert. So it's adapted to very dry, very stressful conditions. It's been moving around. How long has uh, Palmer amaranth been in Maryland? Does anybody know? There's a herbarium report from the Smithsonian that was found in Baltimore area in 1953. Uh, there's a herbarium sample from Worcester County in uh, the 1980s. So it's not new to this area, but in the last five or six years, it has just exploded in terms of infesting ag fields. As I mentioned, it has none to few hairs on the leaf and on the stem. It has long petioles, and I'll see, you'll see a lot of people take the petioles and fold them over and see if it's as long or longer than the leaf blade. And if they is, they'll say, oh, this is Palmer amaranth. Problem is, in order to get those petioles to be long, the plant's got to be at least six inches tall, and that's taller than you want to spray it. So using these, these uh, lack of hairs is, is the key. Occasionally, you might see a watermark on it. As the plant matures and the female plants start to produce uh, um, dry down, it, it'll develop these kind of prickles along the, uh, where, where the leaf petiole is attached to the stem. Um, it can be well over five feet tall if grown in a, a, a good situation. Tall plants, tall long seed heads. Here's these bracts that dry down and turn into prickles and can and basically feel like spines, but they're not true spines. And this is the example of, of uh, the longer petiole that's at least as long or longer than the leaf blade. But again, the key is looking for lack of hairs on these seedlings. Palmer amaranth has no hairs. Smooth pigweed or redwood pigweed has small downy hairs, even at these very small stages. It does very well under stressful conditions. The optimum uh, uh, temperature for photosynthesis is 108 degrees. So while our grain crops have shut down to conserve moisture, Palmer amaranth is still growing. One of the reasons why it is so competitive with our crops. It does well as temperatures climb um, in the summer. 
This is uh, an example of uh, cumulative growing degree days over a, 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 a two-week period, starting in mid-April, going up through early uh, July. And basically what it means is the taller the bars, the more heat accumulation, the, 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 the faster, the more rapid growth we're going to get out of Palmer Amaranth. And uh, you know, what I use with this slide is to kind of point out when we plant corn in our spraying, our post-emergence treatments in corn, we're usually in this late May to early June time frame um, when Palmer Amaranth is, is growing fairly good, but not as rapid as we see when we're putting out our post-emergence soybean herbicides. So in, in, in general, Palmer Amaranth is a little bit easier to control in, in corn. And one of the reasons why is it's a slower growing plant that time of year. When we get into uh, soybeans, and particularly post-emergence spraying for soybeans, they are, very, they are growing very rapidly, and we have this relatively narrow window uh, that we can spray them and, and control them with post-emergence herbicides because they grow so quickly. It's, it's prone to, to resistance. Uh, we, we know that the majority of our plants are glyphosate resistant. A large percentage of them are also ALS resistant, the group two herbicides. We do not have resistance to these other classes in this region, but in other parts of the U.S. they have uh, DNA resistance, that's the Prowl and the Treflan type herbicides. They have PPO resistance, they have HPPD resistant, and I forgot to put on here the triazine resistance. So there's, uh, there's some populations in Illinois that are resistant to like five different chemical families and chemical classes, which really limits the options they have for controlling Palmer Amaranth. We're not there. Um, we just have resistance to the group two and the group nine. And what we've got to do is prevent resistance to these other classes. Because once we start to lose some of these other classes, our options become very, very limited. So uh, Palmer Amaranth control, and like any other problem weed, really comes down to three things. Using the right product at the right rate and the right timing. Two out of the three generally won't help you. It's all three of them, putting all three of them together. And so while this is going to focus on Palmer Amaranth, these principles are true for other problem weeds as well. You know, some of the right products that we have for corn, this isn't necessarily an exhaustive list, but it's some of the more common products that are being used. Starting off with the pre-emergence herbicide, a good pre-emergence herbicide at planting. And the key there is at planting. Um, using uh, something like a Harness Extra or Bicep or Zidua plus Atrazine, one of those group 15 or long chain fatty acids plus a triazine herbicide to give that early uh, 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 control, and then coming back post-emergence in a timely fashion using one of these HPPD inhibiting herbicides like Callisto, Laudus, Impact, or Armazon, and all of those should go out with a little bit of atrazine. Or in areas where it's safe to use some of these safe and dicamba products like Di um, um, Diflex or Status. I mentioned the HPPD herbicides use, including a, a, a triazine with with them. This is a Palmer Amaranth in the greenhouse sprayed with just Callisto. You can see it's whitening, whitening it up, but it's not going to kill it. But you add just, a, in this case, just a pint of, of atrazine, and we basically wiped out that Palmer Amaranth. So these, these uh, um, products do much better with a little bit of atrazine included in them. So when you think of these group 27s, think of atrazine going out with them. But that also means they need to go out um, before the corn gets 12 inches tall, so an early post application. For soybeans, pre-emergence, using not just two mechanisms of action, but two effective mechanisms of action. And remember, we're planting soybeans later in the year as the temperature warms up and where that uh, uh, Palmer Amaranth is getting into a more rapid growth phase. So we really need to start off with a good, solid program that's uh, going to keep it... Uh, um, that's going to give us this early season control and relying on two effective mechanisms of action. And, and as far as chemical families, that's the PPO herbicides like uh, group 14's Valor and Authority, uh, Metribuzin, a group 5, 
or some of these long chain fatty acids like Dual, Zidua, and Anthem. And yes, I get asked about this a lot. Is Dual or, 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 or Zidua good on Palmer Amaranth? And yes, it is. You know, at the right rate, it does a nice job. It's not going to give you full season control, but it will give you a good three to four weeks of residual control. But the key here is two effective mechanisms of action. Here's an example of what I'm talking about. This is Valor XLT, a um, product that uh, is used pre-emergence in soybeans. It contains two different chemical groups, a group 14 and a group 2. Um, so just at, at first blush, you think this is a great uh, effective strategy because it's got two mechanisms of action. And we sprayed Valor XLT to a flat that had uh, Palmer Amaranth seeded in it. And you can see where there, there's, there's no green in it whatsoever. Excellent control. This flat was sprayed with just the Valor portion of this Valor XLT. Um, same rate of Valor um, as we, we have here. And again, excellent weed control. However, when we spray just the Chlorimuron or just the classic portion of it, that Palmer Amaranth is coming through. So um, that's because this, this, uh, uh, most of our Palmer Amaranth is resistant to these, this chlorimeron chemistry. So while we have two different uh, mechanisms of action in this premix, only one of them is effective. That's what we're talking about when we're talking about two effective mechanisms of action. That doesn't mean that we necessarily won't be using chlorimeron. Uh, but we won't be able to rely on it for, for Palmer Amaranth control. And then post-emergence. Our product's available for post-emergence. Um, usually we want a, a product that's going to control the Palmer Amaranth that's up, but also a product that will provide residual control. Uh, this uh, Reflex uh, PPO herbicide from uh, uh, Group 14 has both those properties of post-emergence control as well as residual activity. Another product that works well on, Liberty, uh, um, on Palmer Amaranth is this Liberty uh, with Liberty Link soybeans. But we know that Liberty doesn't have any residual activity. So it, it will need to be tank mixed with something like Reflex, Dual, or, or Warrant. Um, in situations where it's appropriate to use uh, dicamba on these uh, Extend soybeans, using um, Extend or Ingenia or, or Fexopan um, as a post-emergence. But they also have um, very poor residual control of Palmer Amaranth. So they'll also often need a residual product included with them. Again, we want to be careful that we don't overuse our PPO herbicides and develop uh, resistance to that class. This is a, a table from our weed management guide of, of most of the common post-emergence herbicides for soybeans listed here. This is their herbicide group number, and this is their effectiveness on a, a number of our common weed species. So on Palmer Amaranth, you can see we got a lot of products listed there that, that give us good control of Palmer Amaranth assuming the Palmer Amaranth's not resistant. But we know that most of it's resistant to glyphosate and the group two herbicides. So we can take all of those out of the equation because they're not going to control Palmer Amaranth. If we're not careful and we start to develop resistance to some of these other chemistries, some of these popular ones that we're using, like the PPO herbicides, we can lose a lot of products really quickly. And so now, what we've got is we're down to Bassagran, which is not very good. Uh, Ingenia or uh, um, Extended Max uh, with, with dicamba soybeans. And not everyone's going to be able to use those in all situations or just down to Liberty. Fewer products, more selection pressure, and who knows how long those would last. So we would still want to keep this table as open as possible. So making sure that we're, we're not over-relying on these PPO herbicides uh, and, and avoid developing resistance. Right product at the right rate using uh, the, the, the full labeled rate. Uh, things like Callisto using the, th uh, the full three ounces. Um, something like uh, Reflex that we're using the full um, pint and a half rate. 
Now this gets, this gets difficult to keep up with this with our prepackaged mixes because the ratios aren't always uh, apparent to what, what's there. And this, this is kind of an extreme example, but this is what we're talking about. Two active, uh, two products that are uh, premixes that are um, commonly used in soybeans. Uh, the Broad X, which is um, um, basically dual plus uh, authority, or authority MTZ, which is the authority plus metribuzin. Um, both, again, at first look, look uh, provide us two effective mechanisms of action. But we want to look a little bit further as are we getting the right rate of these products? Again, another plug for our, our weed management guide. Um, if we look in this guide and look at uh, on our table 4-9, we see that sulfentrazone is in, in Spartan. If you're using Spartan by itself, um, that's six fluid ounces, which is the same as 1.88 pounds of sulfentrazone. So when we're using these products, we want to be targeting that 1.88 pounds of sulfentrazone. We go to the table that has all of our premixes listed there. So we look at broad axe. It gives us at 28 fluid ounces, and we're getting a pint and a half of dual. We're getting 4.9 ounces of sulfentrazone. That gives us about 0.8 ounces, or 80% of that 1.88 pounds of, of sulfentrazone we're looking for. Not quite there, but, but, but a pretty good slug of, of sulfentrazone. However, we compare that to the Authority MTZ at 11 fluid ounces, which gives us four ounces of metribuzin. That's about the maximum amount of rate of metribuzin we want to use with our soil types around here. Uh, at that rate, it's giving us 1.6 ounces of, of Authority. And that's only 0.6 uh, of the rate of sulf sulfentrazone that we really need. So, Authority MTZ ought to be spiked with some additional authority if we want to use this premix to get us up to that labeled rate of sulfentrazone. So being sure that we're using the right rate and digging deeper into these premixes is are they giving us the right rate? And the right timing. And this is the one we get the most trouble in because we're not spraying it at the right time. Um, uh, our pre-emergence herbicides being applied at planting. Within a week or two of planting is when these residual herbicides need to go out. Palmer amaranth has a long uh, germination period, and these products have only a defined time that they're going to provide residual control. And we want that residual control after the beans have been planted and during their e early season growth. So applying them at planting um, is, is the way we're going to get the maximum effectiveness out of it. Spraying the weeds, and every label says this, spray small, susceptible weeds when they're actively growing. Small, actively growing. You know, a lot of times folks will think, I don't want to come back and spray a second time, so I'm going to wait. I'm going to let, the, let all the weeds come up before I spray. Well, the problem is by doing that, that first flush of weeds gets too tall to, effectively, to be effectively controlled. And those are the ones that are the biggest, the most robust, the most competitive, and are going to produce the most yield. Those are the ones you really want to control. So this uh, idea of waiting, to, waiting till everything is up is going to give us uh, trouble. And particularly in the case of Palmer Amaranth, we have no rescue treatments here. There is no way that we're going to come back and clean up a field that gets out of control. So looking at it uh, with our pre's at planting, this is a study we did with the Delaware Soybean Board where we're looking at residual herbicides either 30 days, 10 days, or right at planting. Um, and we took uh, our, our weed control ratings shortly before our post-emergence were, were applied. We sprayed 30 days early pre-plant. We had a lot of weed, uh, Palmer amaranth breaks at that point. Um, and uh, the plants, not only were there a number of them there, but they were bigger, more robust, more difficult to control. We delayed that application to 10 days or right at planting. We had much better overall control uh, of Palmer amaranth. And when we came in and made our post sprays, they were to small plants and we had uh, excellent Palmer amaranth control. So making those applications as close to planting as possible. 
spraying them when they're small. We all hear this. Problem is, small means different things to different people, you know? And so what we've started to do is try to put an exact number on that as much as possible. I have colleagues that said, oh, it's the Coke test. You put the Coke can out there, and you have to make sure you spray it before it gets taller than the Coke can. Well, it sounds good, but which Coke can are you using? So three inches. That is what we use. That's what I tell folks, three inches. Don't spray it four, three inches. How tall? Three inches. Three inches. All right, all right. This is not small. Three inches, three inches. You're not gonna spray your way out of taller plants. If you're not gonna scout, that comes out to about 28 days after your pre-emergence herbicide was applied. Not, 20 days, not 28 days after you planted, but 28 days after that pre-emergence herbicide was applied. So scouting gives you a little bit more flexibility, but if you're not gonna scout, 28 days. You look at the calendar at 25, and you say, well, in about two days, the wind's gonna pick up, it looks like maybe rain, don't hold off. Go early, because from 28 days to, um, you know, into three or four days later, some of that Palmer amaranth can be too tall to effectively control it. This is uh, some data from uh, Ben Beal, county agent in Southern Maryland, where he was looking at Palmer amaranth down there, and I know this is really hard to see, but it points, I just want to point out a couple of things here. Um, he looked, first of all, looked at a whole bunch of, of different pre-emergence herbicides that he applied at planting. And then he went in um, starting at 17 days after planting and measured the tallest five plants that he found in each plot. So um, what I want to point out here is this gray bar here is 17 days after treatment and everything is less than half an inch tall at that point. So a lot of products are giving us residual control. Um, by 24 days after treatment, the best treatments are still less than two and a half inches tall. Uh, um, you know, Authority XL, Broad X plus Dual, Fierce, um, you know, a number of products are still working at that 24 days after treatment. However, by 31 days after treatment, the smallest plant out there is five inches tall. So just going from 24 to 31 days, Palmer amaranth is getting above that height where it's gonna be effectively controlled. So it's a really narrow window with these post-emergent sprays of getting it out timely. Thus, that's why we spray, say spray it before it's how tall? Three inches. Or 28 days after the last pre-emergence herbicide was applied. And this is why. This is part of it. This is uh, from Purdue, uh, took it from some of the bear uh, uh, literature. This is a Palmer amaranth plant that's only two inches tall, and it has nine growing points along that stem, meaning if the top of that plant is pinched off, uh, we can expect up to nine branches developing along that stem. But by the time that uh, Palmer amaranth is up to four inches tall, there's 22 growing points along there. So a lot more potential for branching if that plant is not completely killed. The other thing is looking at Palmer amaranth at three inches tall, um, you know, a few leaves on it um, still can get good coverage. By the time it's six inches tall, notice the number of leaves and the difficulty in trying to control that. That's that this is that same plant. You can see these upper leaves are going to capture a lot of that herbicide spray and not let it get totally up and down the stem like it needs to to be fully effective. So spraying while they're small and susceptible. It's an example of uh, dicamba, uh, half a pound of dicamba on six inch tall Palmer amaranth in the greenhouse. We put a nice crook in the stem, but we didn't kill it. So spraying while they're small. This is a, a plot with a Palmer amaranth that was 14 inches tall that we sprayed. Uh, we sprayed it with half a pound of dicamba and notice uh, very poor control. We also sprayed plots with dicamba twice, a week apart, 
a half a pound each. And notice, while we did much better on, on the uh, Palmer amaranth, we didn't totally remove it. So uh, uh, you get taller plants, we, 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 we've, we just don't have the, the, the tools for controlling it. We've looked at a lot of premixes, or excuse me, uh, tank mixes and adjuvants on these taller Palmer amaranths. And while they might give us a little bit more leaf burn, they're really not giving us that level of control. The key is spraying them while they're small. Um, you know, row spacing can help out some. This is, uh, di again, dicamba on taller, inch, um, taller Palmer amaranth is 14 inches in 15 inch rows. Not quite as, as much uh, uh, Palmer amaranth out there. Um, two applications did a better job, but the point is, is that once they get large, success is lucky. And it's not, enough, not anything we can really count on. So spraying them while they're small and susceptible. Fields that are continuous cropped, whether it's continuous corn or continuous soybeans, are things that we really have to be on the lookout for and really give consideration that we're not using the same products year after year. Not just same products, but same mechanisms of action. You know, so like with our soybeans, we're often using group two herbicides, um, group 14s, and, and, and you know, we can use Liberty in our soybeans. In corn, we're using a lot of these group fours, uh, 2,4-D or dicamba, these HPPD uh, herbicides. You know, so we want to avoid some of these products that we rely on in soybeans and, and avoid using them in corn if we have some alternatives. One of the things right now we have is, is this HPPD group of herbicides, very effective on Palmer amaranth, but we can only use it in, soy, in corn. We don't have products we can use in soybeans, so it's a, it's a nice uh, rotation. But if we're in continuous corn, we don't want to be over-relying on these HPPD herbicides. Likewise, if we're in continuous soybeans, that we don't overuse these PPO herbicides and develop further resistance. So we have some options available for Palmer amaranth. We need to be careful that we don't develop resistance to, um, with other biotypes. Really what we're looking for is strategies that create shade. Take those selection pressure off herbicides, whether that's using cover crops or just developing a quick, quick competitive crop canopy. And if you have fields with Palmer amaranth, don't spread it, keeping it isolated. Um, I just want to touch on one other, um, and this is a common ragweed. While we are getting a lot of, a lot of the emphasis is on Palmer amaranth, uh, we need to be aware that there's some other resistance out there in, in, in this region. And this is uh, some Palmer amaranth, excuse me, uh, uh, common ragweed uh, from Dorchester County. Um, we have some in the greenhouse right now from Delaware that just look just like this. On, um, this is a, a ragweed that was treated with reflex, a group 14, glyphosate, and first rate. So three different uh, mechanisms of action treated with 1x, 2x, and 4x rate. This population is resistant to all three of those, those chemistry. And so our, our options on controlling something like this becomes very, very challenging. You know, in corn, uh, 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 the, the triazines are still, seem to be still very effective on it. So if with corn, we can use atrazine. Post-emergence, again, possibly atrazine. One of these HPPDs with atrazine, not by themselves, but with atrazine, or some of the safe uh, dicambas like uh, status or diflex. Soybeans, um, some of the uh, products that uh, work well on uh, common ragweed pre-emergence. Metribuzin, Lorox, Linux, Command. How many of you have heard those names in the last 10 years, huh? <laughs> uh, but uh, they work well on, on common ragweed. And then post-emergence, the Liberty Lake soybeans and, and where it's appropriate, the uh, Extend soybeans with the uh, Safe and Dicam or, uh, Dicamba products. So um, with that, I'm going to end it there. Uh, do we have time for a question or two? Sure. We always have time. OK. Any, any questions or comments? Well, I know somebody's going to have some questions. <coughs> you got the iceberg? Yes. Nitrogen on soil grain. 
Yes? What's the time in the durée on it? So the question was um, Metribuzin on small grains. Um, first of all, we have the label for dimetric formulation of, of Metribuzin. Um, the timing, while the label has a fairly wide timing, our research shows it should go out in early spring. Early spring, um, we, we saw very little injury, had no impact on yield. If we delayed that to later spring, we, um, in some years we can reduce our yield um, with that later spring application. Uh, the label can go up to four ounces. In most cases, two to three ounces is adequate. Um, it should go out in water without any uh, nitrogen in the tank for, for burn and uh, should have some non surfactant with that. Um, good on common, um, or on this ALS resistant chickweed, also been uh, pretty effective on uh, ivy leaf speedwell as well also. Um, can be tank mixed with Harmony or, or the Axial, can be tank mixed with a few other things. Do not tank mix it though with PowerFlex. Uh, mare's tail? Mare's tail. It will not control emerged mare's tail. Um, it'll control uh, mare's tail coming up from seed, but if it's emerged, it won't control it. That, that's where maybe the uh, um, um, Dow product Quellex or Bears Husky fits in. Any other questions? If you're interested in those, those guides, and I'm sure you all are now after my talk, uh, I have some slips up here with the uh, address, the uh, uh, website for it. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Appreciate it. Um, just a few more notes about uh, Palmer Amaranth. If you didn't know, um, Delegate Jeff Grace has introduced a bill in Maryland to make uh, Palmer Amaranth a noxious weed. It is a noxious weed in Delaware, correct? And Pennsylvania. And Pennsylvania now. Okay, so um, there has been a, an amendment to the bill to do a summer study. Um, so we had a stakeholders meeting uh, this week, and there was county ag agents, and people from the state, um, county road. So we, um, we had a Farm Bureau, had a really good talk about, you know, what would happen if it did become um, a noxious weed and, um, you know, how would state roads control it, agronomic impact. Um, so the jury's still out on it, but I think the hardest thing, it's not like Johnson grass, it's not like thistle, you know, you heard Mark talk that, you know, that's, it's a resistant weed, so it's going to be very hard to control. So stay tuned for more um, information on that. So I just wanted to tell you that. Um, I forgot to tell you also we have, um, if you're a certified crop advisor, there's credits today, so make sure that um, you sign up for that. Uh, QATV, George Harvey, George, is here. So George comes every year, does a very good job, and he tapes all this, and we will put this out if anybody... Um, missed anything or people that might have missed that, that needed to get their recertification, they can go and watch it and get recertified. So thanks, George, for that. Um, let's see. We have a couple of people that I want to bring up. Um, where's Greg? Greg Hahn. We'll have some of our sponsors come up. So Greg Hahn is here from Helena, so he can give you um, a little update. Um, I just wanted to thank everybody for their business and uh, Mark Van Gessel, he is an asset, not only to the state of Delaware, but to us too. And, um, you know, just to kind of reiterate what he said, you know, not only multiple modes of action, like he said, you know, effective multiple modes of action. I had guys that spent 20 to $40 an acre on soybean herbicides pre that had no need to come back in those fields at all. And their yield showed it. And I had guys that, didn't hardly spend anything that made six trips through a field post and still ended up with weeds, especially um, the ragweed. I mean, it was terrible. You know, they sprayed it five times with Roundup, once with first rate, you know, cadet, other things. Didn't touch it. And, you know, it just pretty much choked out the beans in places. So the effect on their yield was far greater than what it would have cost them to do a good pre-emergent herbicide program. So I just like to, and I don't care who you buy it from, just, you know, stewardship, that's the best <coughs> thing for all of us. So I just want to thank you all again and, you know, look forward to a uh, great year. So. Okay. Okay. 
Thanks, Greg, and thank you for your um, continued support. Um, Greg and I have lots of long conversations also about a lot of different things. Um, Emily uh, Warbert is here from Mid-Atlantic uh, Farm Credit. Um, good morning. I'm Emily Walbert. I work with Farm Credit as a crop insurance agent. Um, this is Nicole Brown. Some of you probably know her. Um, she started with us in December, so she's learning all the fun things about crop insurance. Um, just a couple reminders. Sales closing for most spring crops is March 15th, so if you um, haven't, make sure you talk to your agent um, about your coverage and what works best for you. Um, a couple things that might benefit some of you this year. Um, we've seen where the trend adjusted option can be added to your policy. Um, and you might be able to drop a coverage level, add that TA option, and still get the same guarantee at a lower price. Um, new this year as well is that you can have different unit structures on the same crop in the same county. So last year you could have different coverage levels, and then this year you can have different unit structures. Um, and then lastly, we write for three AIPs, Rain and Hail, NAU, and RCIS. And Rain and Hail this year has joined with John Deere um, to streamline acreage and production reporting. So it might be a little bit easier on you if you have that equipment. Um, so we're here all day. Today we have um, three, or three crop insurance agents as well as a couple loan officers. So if you have any questions, please let us know. And uh, let's see, Tom Weller is here from Ag Risk uh, Management. So Tom, thank you for coming today. Good morning, my name's Tom Weller. I'm with Ag Risk Management. Talk, talk and, and Brittany Steer, Farnham is with me, uh, and she represents us on the Eastern Shore. We were the John Deere Crop Insurance Company, and our <clears throat> agency is primarily interested in technology. So we're one of the leading agencies that deal with the technology. It doesn't matter what color equipment you have or what color technology you have. Technology is a big thing for crop insurance. First of all, tractors can report to us nightly, or you can send us stuff data over the internet, and we can do your acreage reporting completely from your equipment. Uh, saving you possibly acres that you uh, would be paying premium on otherwise. It's also the same thing at claim time. Those combines can report to us nightly by cell phone or they, you can send us a stick or we can do it over the internet. We can collect all of that data and it dramatically cuts down the claim payment time because all that corn goes right to the units. You don't need the tickets anymore. You don't need all of the old paperwork that used to take months to complete. And we can usually pay technology claims within four to five days after they're submitted. And then the last reason that you want to think about technology is how many people have enjoyed an APH audit, a three-year APH audit. Are there any people that have enjoyed it? Well, if you're using technology, it's only six clicks on your computer screen to submit all of the documentation for a three-year APH audit. So technology, if you're thinking about technology or you've already made a large capital investment in technology, you may want to stop by our booth and pick up our brochure on Precision Ag and why it's important to you. I do have a quick exam at the end of my presentation. So, um, the first question is, who's our representative here on the Eastern Shore? Brittany, okay, you answer that first? <laughs> All right, there we go. Okay, so technology can pay your claims within five days. Who said that? Somebody said it over there. There you go, there's Brittany, there's a hand going up. Okay, and who's going to enjoy their next APH uh, audit? Nobody. Come on, six clicks. <laughs> six clicks, it's an easy audit. Okay, so anybody wants to enjoy it? Nobody no hands? Play. Okay, we'll take our other tractor home or you can come and get it at the booth. Okay. Right, Thank yeah. you. Okay. Thanks, Tom and Brittany, for your um, support. Dale Hawks is here from the USDA, the National Ag Statistics Tur Service. I know we all hate surveys, but I can't reiterate how important they are. So, Dale, thanks for... Good morning, everyone. 
Uh, thank you, Jenny, for uh, giving me an opportunity. Uh, we have done the 2017 census, has uh, been mailed out, and everyone has received it. It was due uh, actually back uh, February 5th, but we are still collecting the information. So if you still have the census, you can still turn it in. We also are doing the March Ag Survey. Currently, uh, getting the prospective plantings that are out there, what everybody's thinking about planting, and we'll be publishing that at the end of the month. I think it's 29th of March. Uh, as Jenny mentioned, it is very important that you fill out your surveys and uh, turn them back in. It's going to be combined with everybody else within the county. It's not going to be individually reported. And it's very important for farm programs and other agencies and also farm credit and different people use our information that help you in the end with uh, programs that they can present to the county or to the to the state so please as you get those reports I know sometimes they are a pain to fill out but we really would appreciate that you get them back in a timely fashion thank you and try to do it online this uh, electronic reporting also the census is online you can do it online it's a lot quicker and easier because it gets you through a lot faster uh, than doing it on paper so I do appreciate your time. I do have a booth here. If you want to stop by and talk to me about any uh, complaints or anything that you might have, you can please come by and talk to me about them. Don't know if I can do anything about it, but uh, we can at least talk. So please stop by. Thank you and have a good day. Good. Thanks, Dan.